A warm welcome to everybody who's joined us here today for the Capital Insider. Today we're going to have a wonderful talk on the tech advantage that, of course, we are all seeing as we are between working from homes, um, um, in between lockdowns and unlocks. And of course, the tech advantage is becoming very big and businesses which are either around tech or using tech in large way are the ones who are really flourishing and would be flourishing the way forward. The VC system has been very actively working in terms of helping these businesses flourish. So if I were to give you just some numbers in terms of how the VCs have been helping the venture capitalists have been helping the startup ecosystem to grow. I came across this pain report where I realized that today there are almost about 80,000 startups in India and only about 8% are funded. So that is clearly shows that there's a large opportunity for funding of startups um, that is there and we've only just started in some ways. Um, largely, a lot, uh, particularly if I look at last year in 2019, there were four sectors which got a lot of funding. One was consumer tech. Uh, Sandeep is going to talk a lot about it because he's been um, uh, a great champion of the consumer tech industry. Um, then there has been SaaS, FinTech, and of course, B2B commerce and technologies. Um, and approximately about 35% um, of the total investments with several scale deals exceeding $150 million in 2019 is something that has been seen. So welcome Sandeep. Uh, with, uh, Sandeep Murthy is here with us today, who's a partner in Lightbox and has been leading a lot of investments across various verticals in food tech um, and lots of other industries, which we'll talk about uh, with us today. Uh, so if you know, for all those people who want to ask questions, please go on putting your questions in the Q&A box so that we can take your questions as we go along. Interesting questions. We will also give you the audio and we'll actually uh, talk to you about it. Uh, so Sandeep, welcome once again and um, would love to know how you are looking at things differently in uh, 2020 pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. I mean, I would not say post-pandemic. We're actually right and bang in the middle of the pandemic, really. So, um, but I mean, from a VC perspective, how are you looking at things differently? Um, uh, how are you judging startups today versus how you were judging startups or evaluating startups um, in early 2020 now? Over to you. Listen, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for putting these uh, series on. I think it's uh, so interesting to hear the different perspectives that come about and uh, to even share our ideas as they crystallize. I would say that Look, we set out with our third fund about two years ago. And one of the decisions we made when we set out with that fund was we said, and as you mentioned, we're a consumer focused fund. For us, we said the two biggest things that were going to impact consumption going forward were going to be climate change and social factors. And we kind of looked at that from a more abstract point of view, not necessarily your day to day questions of, you know, is this product right or is that market correct? It's really at a high level. If people are fighting for water, they're not looking to buy jewelry or cars or, or apparel. And similarly, if people are unemployed or underemployed, they don't have the capacity to buy the things they need. And so as we looked at the types of businesses we wanted to focus on and wanted to invest in from our third fund, we wanted businesses that were going to be on the right side of these equations. So we wanted businesses that would be mindful of their environmental impact. We wanted businesses that were going to be mindful of their social impact. So that kind of played out well for us because now if you look at what's happened as a result of COVID, I think we've become, I, I think that we're going to live with a couple of fundamental changes in how consumers think about life moving forward. I think there's going to be expectation of transparency, expectation of hygiene. And I think those are going to be factors that if you are a, a tech enabled business, you're in a better position to provide that insight to consumers. You're in a better position to be able to talk to them about how many people are actually touching their product before it reaches you. And we invested earlier this year in a company called Waycool that's in the agri supply chain business. I can tell you where the banana that you're buying from the shop has come from, how many tans it's touched, and how it got to you. Now that is going to be really valuable and important to people moving forward. So I think that, you know, pre-COVID, perhaps there was, and there was, by the way, and, and we're forgetting, because in the, the sort of mess of COVID, we're forgetting the, the, the sort of end of the party that was already starting. We were seeing that companies that had gone public in the U.S. Um, at, at private valuations of a certain level had come down ra radically in the, in the public markets. We found that public investors were not willing to value unbridled growth the same way. There, there's, this, uh, there's a statement that growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. And um, I think that we were very much living in that way. 
And I think that that had started to correct and people were starting to see that the public markets had a different view on things. And then boom, COVID hit. And I think that that just further accelerated that trend towards saying, wait a second, what are these businesses really about? And by the way, always, it doesn't matter whether it's a boom or a bust cycle or a, a, a uptick or a recession, companies that have strong fundamentals, strong um, differentiated business prop differentiated customer propositions with a business model that works will always find a great market. And I think that we continue to see that. So, I mean, there's a lot I can go into with this. This is a pre proposed post kind of COVID world, but um, I'll, I'll leave it to say that I, I do think that there's, at least for now, a realization and recognition that we need to be more aware of what is your real differentiated proposition and people are valuing that more. That being said, I'll say one more thing before you ask the next question, everything's cyclical. And we saw this before in 2008, global financial crisis hit, everyone said, oh my God, everything needs to be different, unit economics, everything matters. And, and again, I'm, I'm dating myself in this, but since I've been doing this since 2005, I've been through enough of these cycles where the, the only line that matters is at the, at the beginning, it's users, visitors, then it becomes revenue. Then as times get a little bit tougher, people start to ask about gross margin. Then suddenly you start to understand that, wait a second, maybe the financing is not freely available for everything. You start to ask about EBITDA. I don't think we've ever reached profit, but that's a separate equation. But tech companies in general don't have debt, so it's okay. But um, I think that then suddenly the cycle shifts again. And suddenly something else blows up and you start to feel like, wow, great, we should be focused on growth. And so it'll come back. Um, but I think we're in a healthy, healthy-ish place in the sense that businesses are, are being evaluated on, on metrics that I think are important. Sure. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, in 2019, again, the VC industry had deployed almost $10 billion in capital. So in particularly in 2020, what do you think? I mean, in number terms, if you, to, if you were to sort of forecast something, how much investments do you think are going to come from the VC side? And then, of course, we're only just 8% startups have got funding. So there's a lot more to be done there. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just, okay, let's answer the number question first. First of all, Geo themselves have raised about 13 billion. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've, we've exceeded the number by that measure. Um, and, and, and I guess what we tend to look at is what is the concentration of that funding? Now, Geo skews the uh, metrics a little bit, but in the past years, what has happened is more money has gone to more companies than in previous years. So while 5 billion went to 7 billion, went to 8 billion, went to 10 billion, what we also saw happening was the share of capital that the top two or three companies took was a decreasing percentage in each year. So that meant more companies were getting more money, which is really good for the ecosystem. But again, let's take a step back and say, look, what, what is the, the, the trend that we're looking at? The trend that we're saying is, and there's this adage, software is eating the world, right? And that idea that everything is going to be taken over by something that's tech enabled. And I think that that's exactly what we see happening right now. We see that every single area that, has, um, that, that consumers are consuming in has the capacity to actually be, be taken over by a better tech-enabled solution, whether that's in the production of the product, the distribution of the product, or the acquisition of the customer. Right. So in some of these ways, tech is going to do it. So now that those 92% uh, of the companies that haven't gotten funded, my, my question would be, is, are they thinking about how technology can be used in their entire, from production to consumption chain effectively? And if they are, then I think it's a fantastic opportunity for them to actually step in and, and now start to get the capital. And I would argue that that's the argument that's being made to anybody who's looking to invest into India in general, is that you have a massive group of consumers that are gonna step into consumption and be exposed to brands in the most efficient way. Look, one of the other fundamental truths of India is we're a fragmented country. Right. We are, whether right. you look at foods, religions, governments, anything, everything's fragmented. And brands by that measure have also been fragmented. So you don't have this massive, incumbent in every single industry that needs to be disrupted. In fact, technology is the largest unifying platform for distribution for pretty much any product or service. So now that means that the opportunity exists to build those brands in that channel. And you can see that happening with distribution getting concentrated at places like Amazon and Flipkart and Next Geo. You'll see distribution start to concentrate in tech-enabled environments, which means that brands will have to be built in those tech-enabled environments users are consuming content more in tech-enabled environments. And people are doing gym classes in tech-enabled environments. So we're suddenly finding that, so that more and more 
consumption of content and products and services will happen in a tech environment, which only to me means that more companies need to be built in that direction. It's hard, I think, for large, let's say semi-large companies to necessarily adapt to this world right away. And that leaves the door open for a lot of these businesses to step in. And I think that's what we're looking for. So I believe that, that you will find more capital coming into this market for those reasons. And if the entrepreneurs can think correctly about how they can go after that and change the fundamental economics of that, that industry, I, I think we should see a continued rise. Now, this year specifically, I don't know. It's going to be tough to call. Geo has made sure that we're above the mark already from last year. So great. That's nice for the, the scorecard. But uh, I think the reality will be there will be some tentativeness. There's a lot of focus on the existing portfolio, ensuring that things that need to be shored up are shored up. Um, but I think the appetite and the, the, the interest is still there, and, and it'll just be a matter of things needing to stabilize a little bit. Sure. And I mean, since you mentioned that a lot of businesses are now coming in the tech-enabled environments, particularly, you know, I mentioned the four sectors earlier, which were SaaS and consumer tech and fintech and B2B commerce. But what, what new sectors are you seeing uh, coming up and, you know, where you might want to, as an investor, start evaluating startups in that direction? So um, when we talk about consumer tech or fintech, I think these are actually misnomers to that extent, right? We're, we're really saying consumption and finance. And ed tech is really education. And so these are going after the core aspects of these sectors. So, uh, again, it's a... It's a difficult answer for me to give to you because I would actually argue that everything is open. Yeah. Whether I look at healthcare, whether I look at education, whether I look at financial services, whether I look at apparel, whether I look at house, uh, house home improvement, any of these areas, and even entertainment. I mean, look at this in the last 10 days with recent bans on certain apps. You're seeing a massive growth in, in entertainment-related apps that perhaps two weeks earlier we wouldn't have thought about in, in the same way. Now, whether that's sustainable, what that will look like is a separate set of questions. But I, I do think that it will, the opportunity exists to continue to change every single industry because no industry um, is, is being run as efficiently as it can be if it's not using technology in some aspect of how it operates. And I think that that's where, if, if I were to start looking at it, I would say, let's start at how big is the overall industry? So obviously financial services, massive industry, healthcare, massive industry, education, massive industry. If you can get into these areas, I think those will attract a lot of interest. Retail, massive industry. Now, within those, there are obviously segments you can cut and dice and start to get into in different ways. But I don't think the world looks different. It's, it's interesting. Just because the internet arrived, it's not like as humans we consume radically new things or different things. We still need food. We still need apparel. We still need entertainment. These are realities of life. And so <clears throat> I would say that I, I expect that if you look at your own personal consumption or people's consumption and look at how it's split, you probably say, okay, those are sectors that make sense to start to attack. And I think that's how we would look at it. And we try to find the entrepreneurs that are solving those problems. Sure. And I mean, uh, since you mentioned that uh, there's two, so many new areas that are coming up in particularly in 2020 has Lightbox made any investments. And I mean, particularly in the post uh, in the pandemic uh, times, yeah, so we, we haven't announced anything, but I will tell you that we are in, in active engagement on certain, certain types of opportunities, many of which we started prior to, to the lockdown. One of the things, honestly, that we're going to have to learn is how do we assess and get comfort with the people that we're going to be working with on this journey without being able to sit down and spend a lot of time with them face-to-face -face and, and really, I mean, this is great that you, know, you and I have known each other for years, so there's a level of comfort right away that we can step into and have a conversation on. But when you're meeting an entrepreneur for the first time, and you sit down and you say, okay, well, tell me about yourself. And, you know, you only get so much through this, as, as nice as the, the video link might be, you only get so much through that uh, interaction. And so I think we're going to have to learn a little bit about how the next crop of investments are going to be made, or we're going to have to hope that what we have in our pipeline from the people we've met um, is adequate for now. And then hopefully things will open up and we'll have the chance to, to interact. I think, look, the reality is this is a people business. And for us, Knowing the people is what's paramount and really important. So knowing that we have a chance to spend time with them, spend time uh, with them in various contexts and environments, not unfortunately just on a screen is, gonna, is going to be important. But once we do that, I think the screen has actually worked relatively well for us to manage things. Um, but so I, I would say that hopefully in the coming months, you'll see some, some, some stuff from us related to, to new investments. But, uh, but it's a, a learning experience for other areas for us.
Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, if, if I were to ask you, you know, uh, today, even for existing startups, I mean, those eight percent startups life is not easy. In fact, it's tough really because, you know, uh, besides, of course, the fact that they have to uh, go back and tell their investors what they're doing. It, I mean, the, the crisis itself is uh, quite sort of put everybody into a perplex mode about how to achieve what is it that they're looking to achieve. So what, how are you telling or what is it that you are telling your, um, you know, startups in your portfolio uh, to hold on, to not, uh, you know, lose their focus or, I mean, just to sort of um, uh, be able to stay afloat out there. I know, I mean, Rebel Foods is one of your big investments. And today, uh, food and food tech itself is under uh, a big uh, sort of scanner because, you know, people don't want to eat out or order out even from uh, while I know delivery has become the go-to word but people still don't want to go out and order food from outside in their homes so you know what is it that you're telling your current startups to uh, in terms of just stay strong so uh, I think it was in, in late March uh, we put out a blog post which basically said double it and double it meant that Whatever you're thinking is the time horizon for this uh, pandemic, whatever you're thinking is the cash flow horizon you need in the business, whatever you're thinking is in terms of when things are gonna, uh, just looking at the poll. Um, so whatever you think is the, the horizon that you need capital for, double it. And I think actually as time went, we should say triple it. And uh, because I think our grip on, on what the world is gonna look like is, is very tenuous. We don't have clarity on when things are going to shift and how they'll shift. What we do know, though, is that <clears throat> the underlying trends that were there before, I think the pandemic only uh, accelerated them. So let's take delivery, for example. Um, and, and we have a variety of businesses. We have Rebel on the food side. We have Dunzo on, on the general amenities and, and, and other yeah. services side. Um, both have done extremely well as they were in the essential services category and were able to continue to run during this period. I think the onus is upon each company now to provide the customer the comfort, as I talked about earlier, on transparency and hygiene. Now, <clears throat> both companies are approaching it in, in their own ways. Rebel has a platform called EatSure, which now talks about giving customers the comfort. I, I'll give you an example just to take a step back for a second. We lived, we've all lived through various uh, terror attacks. 2611 took place. Um, it was a uh, horrible and, and difficult time. And I think at that point in time, if you ask anyone on that day, will you step back into a five-star hotel? They probably say, I don't know, I'm a little wary. I'm not sure when I want to go. I don't know what it's <laughs> yeah, like. And, and I, can, I, I can't tell you if I, I can even remember a day where I didn't think about going to one because suddenly now security has become the norm. You're comfortable with it. You're, you're confident that you know, things are being taken care of at whatever level they need to, and you've moved on with life. Yeah. I think often in tech, there's always this conversation around privacy, security, all these types of things come up. Today, I imagine many people will be storing their credit card information with various service providers. Now, again, if I rewind, again, dating myself to the start of the internet when things took off, there was a big question. Is it safe to keep your credit card online? Is it safe to use your credit card online? What will happen? Will someone steal it? Will we Today, we willingly give it to an Amazon or to Netflix or to any of these number of providers. And so you adjust. And I think that the, the amazing thing about people is we are very resilient and adjustable and we have short memories. And uh, so as much as today we are stuck in this world where we're thinking about the concerns of ever shopping in the physical environment again, ever um, picking up a package without sanitizing it in a certain way, I think that th there will be enough innovation and enough uh, care and, and communication done by the companies in these spaces to give people the comfort around it. So what, I, what we're telling our companies to focus on, focus on these aspects. Understand what are the product and, and service changes you'll need to make so that you can ensure that you're on the right side of the equation. I mean, we have businesses that run physical retail outlets as well. I mean, it's a big question. It's, it's what's going to happen to physical retail moving forward? Actually, the, 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 the direction of what's going to happen to it going forward is in our hands. How we determine what to say about it and how we determine how it's going to function will actually determine how consumers will respond as well. If we shut the shops and say, my God, please don't come, we're scared, they're not going to come. If you open them and run them and give them the confidence and comfort that you've addressed the issues, and you, you do it, so you actually do it. It's not just lip service. It's not this idea of <clears throat> just saying, no, no, it's okay, don't worry, come on in. You actually, actually have to do the things and give them the, the, the understanding of what you're doing. I think it'll be okay. 
So what we tell our companies is conserve cash, invest in the things that are absolutely essential, double down on product innovation. Now is not necessarily the time to ramp a, a ton of customer acquisition. Um, customers, I think themselves are figuring out what they want and what they need and what's essential for them. And honestly, with, with, with layoffs and pay reductions, just simply who will consume when is still simply a question out there. So I think that we have to calibrate where your product sits and for what consumer it's an essential and not. You have to understand how you're going to give them the comfort that they, that's safe to transact with you. And I think that's how we should spend our time right now, making sure these things are in place. Sure. No, I think uh, those are good pieces of advice, which could probably come uh, very handy to all your uh, portfolio companies and also to the ones who are not. Uh, it's, it's, it's really great advice. You know, I was just seeing the results of the poll that uh, was recently conducted and I saw that 57% of the people said that the deal has gone on hold. I mean, obviously, they must have talked to a VC fund and the deal was nearly there and due to the pandemic, things uh, went on hold. So what are the three pieces of advice that you're going to give to people who had a near deal, but uh, the deal did not go through and what is it that they should be resilient about in terms of... Um, raising capital today? Well, first of all, look, <clears throat> raising capital is like getting on a treadmill. And I think I've said that uh, in some form here as well in the past. Once you start, you can't stop. And so if it's your first time raising for your business, I would say really think about it now it's necessary to do that. Um, because once you're on that, you're starting to spend someone else's money. You brought someone else into your company to share the vision with. It's, a, it's equity. It's not debt. So they are entitled and and you would expect that they, they would contribute um, because they are taking both the upside um, going forward and they're bearing the downside risk so if you've not raised and uh, you're in those conversations I'd take a step back and think about is now really the right time do you need to now there's a ton of reasons to raise money uh, recession recessions are one of the best times to build businesses we know that from various stories of, of, of history and I think the the fundamental realities are there's less uh, marketing going on, so costs are, of acquiring customers should be better. There's less opportunities for people, so hiring should be more effective. There's less competition in general, so your message gets across effectively and you can focus on your product differentiation. All of that makes a lot of sense. So if you really believe you have that differentiated product proposition, you really believe you have that customer insight that's there, then keep hammering at it. Um, conserve cash to focus on the areas that drive the real differentiation you need. Our, our philosophy, whenever you raise money, um, sorry, I'm looking at the next question. One of the guys I said, okay, fine. All right. Um, it, our, our philosophy every time we invest in a company is to, once we've invested, start to make the deck for the next round right away. Because you want to know what is the biggest risk that the next investor is expecting you to mitigate. So if you haven't raised money, think about the question of what is the biggest risk that the investor is looking for you to have addressed and focus just on that. It's, and if you have raised money, by the way, it doesn't really change much. It's the same, same question. Really, what is it that you need to prove to get that next round in the future? Everything else to me is nice to have. It's superfluous. It's not essential right now. Um, since essential has become the word of the, the past quarter, we'll keep with it. So focus on the essential aspects of your business, just like the essential services that are available out there. Focus on making sure that those are the things that you are improving. And those are the things that are actually demonstrating your clear differentiation. So in some cases, it might be that your product's retention is much higher than anybody else's. So let's make sure that that's the case. Let's measure all the metrics in place, focus on that one metric, and maybe that's the key for the next investor buying into your business. Maybe it's you have the ability to acquire customers much more cost-effectively than everyone else. Okay, let's focus on that. You save people money in, in how they actually use your product. Let's focus on demonstrating that effectively. So I think it is narrowing your focus. And um, that, by the way, is healthy advice at any point in time. It's just essential practice at this point in time right now. So I, I think that's, that's what I would look at. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I mean, it's again, as I keep saying that, you know, we have to find ways of survival in this crisis and uh, any advice is good advice uh, as long as one can apply it very quickly. Um, so, you know, another question I would have from you is that particularly with Chinese investment not looking to happen now, um, and of course, in fact, so much so that the uh, startups today who've been coming on our uh, webinars and they've raised some Chinese capital in the past, they've been facing some angst from, uh, you know, people in terms of that they should actually exit it. So do you, do you foresee any kind of uh, uh, problems in terms of startups who are already sort of uh, 
do not have the advantage of funds reaching out to them or uh, VCs being able to, or they being able to reach out to the VCs. And particularly with Chinese money also gone, there's going to be a little more dampener in terms of raising investment in the coming days. Uh, you see, everything looks extreme in the current moment. And I think that in the current moment, when you sit and look at it, you would say, wow, so much capital has just been removed from the system. And sure, as we sit here today, and maybe as we sit for the next two or three months, we'll look at this and say, wow, this is really going to be horrible. How are we going to survive? But then if you were to look at the lens that says, okay, let's say 12 months from now or 18 months from now, if we were to look back and say, okay, what would have happened? My, my bet is what happens is other capital comes to fill that gap. I think that <clears throat> there are, there, and there's a lot of money in the world, just so we're, we're, we're clear. It, it needs to find places for it to deliver growth. We need to demonstrate that we are a stable economy that has the potential to build and grow value through our businesses and capital will come here. So I, I'm less worried about it. I think some companies with high burn rates that have been dependent on capital to fund that and fuel that for a period of time will have existential issues. They will be clearly worried about how they'll survive. <clears throat> but if you're again a business with a product proposition that's clear, you have an economic model that is based on solid fundamentals. I think you'll have the ability to adjust your model. You'll have the ability to, to take a breath. Perhaps your growth rate will reduce, but you hopefully won't have existential issues, which then means you're just going to wait it out until the time comes where, let's say, the market breadth of investors suddenly increases again. Maybe it'll be filled by another geography of investors. Maybe you'll have local Indian funds come up who will be able to make a case saying that, look, we understand the market really well. And we've seen new funds crop up last year itself. Um, and I think that as a result of that, you'll see turnover in that industry as well. And you'll see expansion of the market there also. So perhaps current funds will raise larger uh, amounts of capital. Perhaps uh, new, new funds will, will come into the market. And so as a result, I would say that, um, yes, it's going to be disheartening for a period of time. And yes, it's going to be challenging for certain companies that are perhaps dependent on one or another source of specific capital. But just like we've seen in other cycles, things come back. Now, the challenge is you have to survive through it. And, and to your point earlier, it's all about survival. And, and I think actually, quite honestly, there's an opportunity to thrive right now. There is a chance where if your product is right, and look, this is a pretty consistent refrain for me for the last 15 years. Have a product differentiation, please. If you have that, I think you have something to stand on in terms of how you can acquire, retain, or monetize your customer base. And, and that is what will kind of fed you through these times. And then I think you'll find investors like us and others who will be very interested in speaking to you. And uh, you'll probably find that you'll get an audience with people that, as the noise has filtered down a bit, that you may not have otherwise had. Sure. But I mean, on another side, I mean, as an investor, if you were to look at things, particularly, you know, a lot of exits uh, for Indian startups came on uh, foreign capital. So, you know, we, there used to be um, investors in Silicon Valley or even in Middle East or China or some other countries where the exits largely used to happen, even in Europe. So particularly, I mean, you know, with uh, traveling not happen and, you know, we all being more closer to home and looking closer to home at things. Um, and, you know, honestly, putting big monies on in terms of a startup without looking at his facilities, his teams and et cetera, et cetera. Do you think exits are going to be harder this year uh, versus what you've seen probably in 2018 or 2019? And of course, with Chinese money also gone, is it going to bring more impact on things? Look, I think exits are going to be harder. There's no, no two ways about that. I think that, uh, and, and look, there would have been a variety of reasons why. I think it's an election year in the U.S. Um, that always tends to bring about a lot of wait and watch and see what happens. Um, the, the pandemic doesn't help people's uh, concern. One of the, the, the points that I've, I, again, when people ask the question of, so what worries you um, in general with, with investing overall? I'm not worried about a lot except for sentiment shift. I think sentiment shift is the single biggest challenge that we have in general as an industry to be able to grow businesses in. Because sentiment shift quite radically and quite suddenly and then take a, a while to settle back again to a position. And what they do, again, they swing radically in that direction. So right now we have a sentiment shift towards fear. And that's a global sentiment shift. And people don't know how to act. People don't know how to react. People don't know what to project moving forward. And so that just puts everyone in a bit of a, a deer in the headlights kind of position. And I think that that is a reality we have to face. And so, yes, if you were expecting liquidity in this year, it's going to be challenging. And I think it's going to have to, everyone's going to have to take a step back. 
Now, and that being said, the fortunate thing about India at this stage at least is that compared to let's say 2008, we've been around now for another 12 years. The, the ecosystem has been there. Companies have been coming here. Uh, you have multinational companies in the market. You have strategics that aren't necessarily having to get on a plane for the first time and do this. I mean, okay, again, we'll take Geo as an example. In the, the middle of the lockdown to raise $13 billion without arguably having anyone come and visit or arguably getting on a plane and going anywhere is a testament again to the fact that, okay, they are a powerhouse as a, a company goes, but also there's enough conviction in their overarching story of where they believe India is going. So yeah. if they can tell that story of what India is doing to a bunch of very sophisticated large investors in a certain way, I'm pretty confident that people searching for growth after this in, in, entire thing settles down will also look to India and start to understand that, okay, underlying fundamental things are still realities. As long as as a country, we can continue to maintain an environment of positive attitude towards investment, of collaboration with businesses, I think we should be able to weather that storm and we'll start to see liquidity come back. But it will be a tougher year. Okay, sure. Um, so we have some questions from our audience. So Manav Modi is asking that how can a prototype be created from an idea? Pretty basic, but I mean, uh, in today's time, how would you like to answer that? Well, I mean, I think a, a lot has to do with what industry you're in or what product or service you're providing. I mean, I think prototyping a software solution is a lot easier than perhaps manufacturing a, a product that you want to make, um, which also, by the way, might start to filter businesses more towards certain types of opportunities versus others. I mean, the reality is if I can't go prototype the next widget that I want to make or the next car that I want to build or the next electrical thing that I want to ma manufacture, then perhaps the areas I'm going to focus on are software solutions where I can actually get a group of developers to work on the code and, and put it out there. Now, again, these things are, are realities for today. I would also venture to say that even if you have to get something manufactured as a prototype, there's a lot of other work that needs to be done alongside that. You're not just prototyping for the, the sake of the prototype. You're also trying to figure out the prototype for your overall business. So perhaps there are other aspects you can trial. Perhaps there's certain... Um, testing of the customer segment to understand what, what pain you're actually solving, if they're actually able to give you that feedback. I mean, you've just done a poll here and we're getting some certain thoughts as to what people feel about certain things. I imagine tapping into audiences to understand that, tapping into insights into what the problems are with the current product solving it. There's a variety of ways to prototype. So I guess what I would say is that if you think about it more as prototyping your business and not prototyping your product, maybe you'll find things to actually allow you to keep moving the ball forward and perhaps learning a lot more as you go along the way. The key in this early stage of, of the business before you've started something is learning. And, and if you can find ways to learn as much as you can, I, I think you're making progress and moving forward. And I would focus on that then. Sure. So there's another question we've received by email. Um, it reads like that India focused VC funds raised approximately $2.1 billion in 2019. Um, and that the fundraising uh, which was less than 2018 but um, I mean 2020 uh, how how is it going to be for you we, we, look, we keep talking about startups about facing difficulties but you know I'm sure VC funds too are facing difficulties today it's it's everybody's in the same business so you know particularly from 2020 point of view do you feel that it's going to be difficult for a VC to raise a second or third round of funding to invest in startups Look, I think the way funds work is they operate on, on vintage years and cycles. So there are many funds that were started, let's say, together in 2014-15 timeframe. There are many funds that were started together in 2005 and 6 timeframes. So you have funds that operate on certain cycles. We would have seen just earlier this week Sequoia raised their next India fund um, in the midst of all this, which is uh, fantastic for them. So I, I, I think that there will definitively be a challenge for first-time funds to, to get up and running during this period um, for the reasons that we've just talked about. You can only get so much out of the screen. And so if you're an LP meeting a, a fund, they have the same kind of uh, assessments that they're trying to make about investors that we're trying to make with entrepreneurs. So all of those for a first time fund will make it much more challenging. I think if you're on a repeat fund and you're looking to continue to do what you said you were going to do and you can talk to sort of why things are working or what, what hasn't worked, I think you probably get a good audience with your existing investors and there's still a chance for it. 
All that being said, I think to the point that 2018 and 19 saw a lot of funds get raised, probably just means that in general, 2020 isn't going to be a large fundraising year either way. Um, and so people have powder, they have capital that they can invest. And I think that bodes very well for entrepreneurs. So there are funds sitting on money. There are uh, funds that have been in the market for years. Again, versus 2008, let's just look at it that way. We have so many funds that have been here now for anywhere from, let's say, 5 to 10 to 15 years that have deep uh, limited partner relationships that they can uh, call upon to be able to get the capital that they need to be able to fund the companies that they'd like to. Now, the, the challenge, though, for everybody at a macro level is when is India going to deliver the returns against that? And I think, unfortunately, 2020, while we had hoped that it was going to be a year where a lot of those questions were answered, probably going to have to wait another year or so for, to, to really see that. And that will be a, a question that will weigh for everybody. And, um, but look, like I said, there's enough capital in the market. There's enough people, us included in that, that are willing and interested in investing in businesses. So as an entrepreneur goes, I would say your, 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 your market is still open for you and you should definitely be out there talking to people. Sure. So we've got another question from Chirag. Uh, can we give the audio to Chirag? Unmute Chirag, please. Chirag, please unmute before you ask the question. Okay. I think I should ask the question on his behalf. Okay. Chirag, are you... Are you ready to ask the question? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So sorry, hello, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we, can hear you, we can hear you. Go yeah, ahead. I'm having some problem with my audio. Uh, yeah, so my question was predominantly on what, what are your insights or what are your thought process on how the retail landscape is going to look like currently with the current, you know, with, with the COVID that has happened. Do you see uh, businesses uh, moving to a hybrid model or do you see businesses sticking to like just an online presence because if you see uh, in the developed world quite a few brands have kind of you know filed for bankruptcy or are kind of looking at shifting their business model more geared towards the online presence so do you see a similar trend taking place in India as well? So look, I, I think in general, we've said that the pandemics accelerate underlying trends. We were already seeing a growth in online commerce overall in the market. So I think if anything, you're going to find that this shift has opened people's minds up more and more towards being able to buy different products online. And look, we, we have a, a business called Bombay Share Company in the apparel space um, that operated actually 16 physical retail outlets. And, uh, and we also had an online presence. I can tell you that we are categorically more focused on the online part of the business today than we will be on the offline side of it. And so I think that you will see a, a shift just because there's an opportunity to do so. It is, uh, we always expected, and our reason for investing in that business, by the way, was because we expected to invest in the tech that would allow us to grow it in an online manner. Not dissimilar to what we did with Rebel as well in the food space. When we invested in Rebel, they operated 60 restaurants where people actually walked in. 90% of the revenue at the time we invested was from people coming to, this, uh, to, to, their, to their restaurants and ordering. 10% was from people phoning and getting delivery. Today, 100% of the revenue is all through apps and, and all through cloud kitchens. So those are, that was a trend that took place and a shift that we enabled independent of COVID. So I think that the, Chirag, the answer to your question, at least from my lens, is to say that this was a, a, a bet we were making and an area, a direction we were investing in even prior to this. If anything, this accelerates it. And I think that you will find that more companies will understand what a offline channel can be useful for and use it in that manner for what it is and invest in ensuring that the technology they have allows them to reach a broader base of customer, customers in an online environment as well. And it's going to be supported by so many people in the ecosystem. I and mean, what's amazing, and, and I know this wasn't your question perhaps, but I'll just uh, I'll bring another point into this. What's fantastic to see is the capital coming to Geo, combined with the commitment that Amazon has to the market, combined with the capital that Walmart Flipkart has available to itself, ensures that they are going to invest, combined with, by the way, Google and its focus through payments and that infrastructure layer, shows that there's going to be a massive amount of money spent on bringing customers into a technology-enabled environment to transact. As a brand or as a retailer, I want to take advantage of that. Because it doesn't matter. My store might get footfall again, and it might do well, 
but there is no way it'll ever match up to the sheer volume of people that I could reach online. And so it would be foolish for me not to consider that and not to take advantage of that and not to build with that in mind. So I think you will see a shift in the landscape. Retailer, retailing in a physical environment won't go away. It will change. Perhaps it won't be the focal point for many people going forward. Perhaps mom and pop shops will thrive. We have another business called Demzo, which actually helps mom and pop shops actually ensure that they're meeting customers' needs. And in a, in a world where Amazons and Flipkarts and big baskets of the world are providing a different type of service. So I think that there will be some settling again of the, the, the system that needs to take place. During that time, if I were to look at it, I would invest in the technology backend infrastructure to allow you to be able to compete effectively moving forward. Uh, I think there's another question uh, that's come about Chinese money. Do you think that the Chinese money will, uh, okay, we can give it to Saurabh actually. Saurabh is online. Saurabh, if you can unmute, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so my question is that uh, you said that uh, uh, you know Chinese investment will uh, you know get uh, replaced by money else from elsewhere. There's a lot of money across the world, but you know, uh, and you talked about uh, Reliance. So now Reliance is a behemoth. You know, we can't compare it with startups. And uh, when you look at the overall economy uh, 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 of the country, it's going to contract. I mean, it's official, and the ratings agencies have also downgraded. Uh, India. So you you really think that money from elsewhere like pension funds or other money can uh, head towards India? So look, I, I think that things are cyclical. And uh, you're absolutely right that the reality of the, the world is that the world will contract right now. And, um, you know, we've gone back and looked at the, the previous uh, variety of crises, including 1918 and the Spanish flu. And you kind of realize that the things that broke things open at that point in time were actually tech innovation. At that time, I think it was the washing machine and the car and the very basic things that kind of got people to say, I, I want to spend on these things. And that opened up the market in some way, shape or form. If I think about India moving forward, I think there's a lot of chaos and inefficiency that's intrinsic in our system. It's just a function of being a very large country and uh, having grown very organically in that manner. And so as a result, there's massive opportunity to, to improve in many areas. And whether that's going to be in the future in terms of electric vehicles and the, the role that they play, whether that's going to be in city planning aspects of it and, and things that might change there, healthcare in different ways, there are basic fundamental services that people are going to want. And I think even now, let's just take education, for example. We've seen in general a need, forget a willingness, a need for students to have to learn through Zoom classes. Um, my kids are going through this day in and day out. And suddenly what would have been thought as, as sacrilege to have a kid sit in front of a screen for four or five hours a day um, being taught is now the norm. Now, what that means is perhaps when schools reopen, certain schools will reopen, but perhaps this model will now be better understood and accepted by a broader range of people. And so, I, I, and I, I'll get to your question in terms of other capital coming in, but it starts with ideas first. If, we're, if we have ideas that we're able to make a case for why they make sense to invest in and grow, I think capital will assess that and decide whether or not it makes sense. So it starts with an entrepreneur saying, listen, this is why, in fact, I can change the face of education and reach so many people and build an interesting business, which then comes to an investor who says, wow, that looks interesting. We need more money in this market because we're finding more and more of these opportunities interesting. That story then gets told back to a bunch of pension funds, uh, foundations, family offices around the world who then look at it and say, hmm, okay, seems to make some sense. If we're not ready to tell those stories or explore those ideas, you're absolutely right. No one's going to pick up and, and, and the phone and say, hey, is there anyone in India looking for some money? That's not going to happen. There has to be people that are looking to build and change interest, build, build interesting businesses and change the market. And then absolutely, I think capital will come. That's how it's come so far. So I, I would say that, that that's what gives me hope because I do still see over 100 plans a month that come into our system that are interesting. And, and we see more and more of them continue to come. And they're by entrepreneurs who have lived the journey now. So I think we are, we're, we're in a healthy place. We just need to now get those stories uh, synthesized, get them out there. And, and I think people will, will be aware. And India is not this unheard of area. People have seen it. They've understood it. They've understood what works, what doesn't work. The, some people are, are still um, perplexed by it and are still trying to figure it out. But it's up to us to tell those stories. So if we can tell those stories well, I think we can get the, the attention we need and the capital we need. Sure. So there's another question that as an investor, are you suggesting M&A 
route to exit for your portfolio companies uh, with startup funding down by almost 29% in the second half of the year. Uh, is this something you can say? m and is always an option and m and is always a, a, a reality. So China has their massive large guys, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Xiaomi. The U.S. has pick an acronym, Fang, GAFA, whatever it may be. They have large companies that are known to be your super consolidators. As we've thought about the Indian market, we have our own acronym for it, and that's Mr. Fat Bug. And, and we say it's Mr. Fat Bug because the M can stand for any of the number of Indian companies that might be there. Make My Trip, for example. R could be a Reliance, for example. F could be a Facebook or a Flipkart, for example. A could be an Alibaba, or could have been, let's say to an extent. So the fact is, the m and landscape in India can be very broad because we are have been largely an open market that has allowed for many players to want to come in and many players will be interested in acquiring companies that actually add uh, differentiated value to their customers. So yes, we've always believed in M&A as an option. We've also fundamentally invested with the idea that a business should be able to stand on its own. So we are building with the intent of being a, a freestanding company. However, we're actively always considering what the options might look for for M&A. Um, you know, I got a question by email and I, uh, uh, so a brand asked me this, that, you know, is there a possibility for a startup to come and um, put an app for a market? I mean, let's say in Delhi, there are, you know, hubs, for example, there's a South X market and there's a, um, uh, for, uh, there's a cannot place market in which there are different brands and people typically tend to go to these brands, at least they used to in pre-pandemic days uh, to shop. So is there a possibility of having a startup uh, or an opportunity for a startup to be able to put an app which is actually more uh, regionalized and uh, in one sense really a hyper local uh, for, to, to be able to meet the needs of the customers uh, in that particular region or area from those stores. So uh, absolutely, it's called Dunzo. Yeah, um, I know Dunzo. So that's, that's, that's exactly uh, what we've done. Mean, putting their data, it could mean taking retailers data, putting it on that app and actually being able to show their merchandise and uh, show their uh, uh, content. In fact, you know, I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm asking you this question because I know of Dunzo, but you know, for Dunzo to actually do it across all markets to that an extent, do you think it needs to be regionalized or do you think it should be done by one large uh, startup? So look, I think there are a variety of, of companies everywhere that, have, that have, have, are working to bring offline players online and, and bring them onto a platform. If we're now saying, let's get the con market uh, uh, community of shops onto one app so that you feel like you're going to con market, I, I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the same metaphor that needs to translate into an online environment. You probably want to go to the two or three shops you go to in con market and you're happy knowing that those are accessible to you. You're not necessarily interested in dealing with the chaos of the traffic and replicating all of that in your online experience. You simply want those shops. So, I think that maybe indexing them, searching for them, being able to categorize them by, by certain locations is useful. And that can be done by a variety of players. So, and, and I think that you'll start to see that. And I think that that's what will be necessary for the offline smaller brands that have a opportunity to actually um, continue to maintain their, their uniqueness and their presence is to ensure that they are, they are accessible in an online environment and are known for the things they're known for. If you're known for being in con market, Okay, but I assume you're known for your products that you sell. You're known for a certain set of things that you have. And so I, I think that, yeah, we'll see that stuff happen. Um, but I, I'm not sure, I'm not necessarily, and look, the great thing about entrepreneur investor discussion is that an entrepreneur will convince us why that market exists and how that should work. Sitting here today, I, I don't see it off the, right off the, the top of my head, but uh, I, I'm happy to be pitched and told and, 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 and explain to you why it works in, in a certain way. I think uh, the question actually came uh, came from a consortium of retailers in uh, South X to me, uh, saying that, you know, if there was a possibility of a startup to be doing that. And uh, so I think, yeah, I mean, it, it could be a good possibility for at least uh, South Delhi to be able to have its own app uh, wherein they can just shop from their whatever local shops. We have, I think yeah. we'll take one last question. Um, it's a bit... Uh, specific so uh, you can choose whether you would like to answer it this is about your investment thesis for rebel and uh, chirag is saying that uh, from my understanding the unit economics may not make sense because the orders are actually being placed on swiggy or zomato so um, i mean you know he's really 
talking about the maths of cloud kitchens? Sure. Uh, I guess the simplest answer is they do make sense. Um, and I think I can, I can uh, assure you that neither would, would the company have, neither would we have invested, nor would they have raised as much money as they have subsequent to that um, if, if, in fact, we weren't able to show that. Uh, I will say that, look, every retail business has, and let's just, let's just take for a second an offline analogy. Someone runs a mall. In the mall, there are shops. Um, some shops will do well. Some shops will do less well. And I think that's it. Swiggy and Zomato are a mall. We are uh, a set of shops that run within them. And we've understood how to run efficiently in that mall. And uh, I think that it might be more challenging if you're a smaller player. So again, let's take Zara as a large player in any mall. We'll have one set of terms versus a smaller shop, which might have a different set of terms. Zara will also make a larger commitment to real estate. We'll make a larger commitment to orders and all those types of things. So scale helps in different ways. And uh, I think that it, with Rebel, we are now definitely at a scale that is beyond anybody here in India and actually quite honestly beyond anybody globally as it relates to brands owned under a platform operating uh, this type of a business. So um, I'll tell you that the, the math works extremely well also because we own our brand and therefore we control the entire supply chain. That's another big learning that we've had over the past few years in businesses like Melora, in businesses like Prolenco, in businesses like Rebel, where we are full stack operators. We've understood that owning the manufacturing process in some way or controlling the manufacturing process is essential to be able to, to ensure that you're capturing the right amount of margin to make the economics work. So if you've looked at uh, a, a food model and you've thought about the economics in a certain way, perhaps you've thought about it from a subscale perspective, or perhaps you've thought about it from a perspective that doesn't have enough deep supply integration to get the advantages that we get uh, that way. So. Sure. I mean, just from my understanding, when you say that you control the manufacturing process, I mean, once you think the cloud kitchens will start becoming big enough, I mean, and I mean, you know, to the likes of the size of Somatos and Swiggies, do you think they would also want to control the distribution process themselves? I mean, like Domino's did in India with the 30 minute pizza delivery and so on. So today we operate about 300 cloud kitchens um, with, I would say at least eight brands of scale on the, on the network. Um, I think that replicating that scale and remember you're making food, you're making food in a distributed manner across the country where again, we're not known for a very, high level of consistency and supply chains to be able to ensure that. And also, by the way, consumers, I think, will want more and more fresh and, and, uh, and less packaged processed food. So to, to be able to facilitate that, to enable that type of a, a system to work, it's complicated. And if you have an existing business, if you're Swiggy or Zomato, that's involved in distribution, if you're the, again, let's take it very similar. If you're the mall operator, can you tomorrow become Zara? Um, just because you operate a very large mall doesn't mean it's any easier to become that. I mean, it's, it's a very different business. Making food, making recipes, designing menus, all of that is a very different business than necessarily running a network of delivery partners uh, around the country. And so I think we have a very symbiotic relationship, honestly, with uh, both Swiggy and Zorado that works to each of our strengths and advantages. And I think that that's probably healthy for the ecosystem overall. And I think if I were to say, a takeaway out of COVID is that I think places where people thought they should compete um, or could compete, they've started to realize they probably are better off partnering and working together. And I think this is no different. I mean, we have a, a good relationship there. And in many of our other businesses, we found that places where this question may have arisen saying, could that distribution partner or could that supply partner become a competitor in some way, start to realize that they're not interested anymore and, and they see the benefits of what we provide. Sure. Uh, thanks, Sandeep, uh, for talking to us. And, you know, before I actually conclude this, I would love for you if you can tell us what are the four consumer tech uh, areas that you are looking up in 2020 in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, most promising or most emerging and therefore you might want to look at as an investor in those areas. Okay. Um, look, like I said before, I, I tried to, to duck this question, so to speak, by saying that everything is interesting. Um, but we push to narrow it. Look, I, I'll say that I think that healthcare continues to be interesting. I think it's a massive problem, and I would I would focus on that. 
we have not found the right thing in financial services yet. And I'm not saying FinTech, I'm saying financial services. So I would say that that continues to be interesting for us to learn and see what is the right type of business for us to, to get involved in there. <clears throat> um, I think that, and I don't have the right answer on city planning and, and city management of, of traffic and, and people in some way, shape or form. Um, in an ideal world, I would say a ways equivalent and what they were able to do with helping people understand traffic. If we can find a software solution that does it, um, that, that would be interesting to think about. Uh, finally, yeah, fourth one's a difficult one. I, I mean, it's a simple one to go back to education, but um, I, I think that it's, uh, th there's gotta be a lot done there. And, and we've been fortunate enough, we invested in Imbibe and Imbibe is now part of, of, of Reliance and they're doing an amazing job with that. So we'd have to really make sure we found an area of education that I don't think is effectively being addressed by some of the larger players and, uh, and then try to go into it. So there's four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think interesting times we're heading into and I particularly the kind of pitches that we've started receiving, they look so much different than the kind of startups and pitches we used to receive back in 2019. So we're essentially moving into very really changing times and new kind of businesses. As you mentioned yourself, I've seen your previous presentations and that's why I was asked, very keen to ask this question from you, uh, for you to sort of give me a grid as to what uh, the new kind of consumer tech companies are looking like. But thank you again, Sandeep, for talking to us, your vision. Um, and your insights are always very useful and they always provide a great learning opportunity for everyone who's looking to uh, start up or, you know, think from a startup to a growth stage. So thank you for talking to us here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and uh, for all our people, uh, if you have more questions who are attending here either on um, uh, Zoom or are attending us on Facebook Live, if you have some questions, please put it there in the comments box and we will make sure that we will get the answers from you. Uh, answers uh, sent to you. We will ask Sandeep's team if they can take a few minutes to actually write down these answers and uh, send it across to you. So thank you once again, Sandeep. Appreciate your being here today.